Welcome to California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. On this episode, we'll be speaking with Senator Ed Hernandez. We will also be joined by Assemblymember Charles Calderon. He is the majority leader in the California State Assembly. And then we are joined by Mr. Calderon's son, Ian Calderon. He is actually a candidate for the California State Assembly and his very first job in politics was Senator Ed Hernandez. Yes. So it all comes around. Sir, you are the chair of the Senate Health Committee. Yes. And so I want to talk to you again about federal health health care reform. It's been several weeks since the U.S. Supreme Court uh, made its ruling upholding the Affordable Care Act. As you're on the streets of your district mm -hmm. in California, what are you hearing about the upholding of the ACA? What I'm hearing now that the public realizes the benefits that are offered, guaranteed issuance, most importantly the children can now be insured up to age mm -hmm. 26 benefits to prescription drugs for seniors, community rating. Their Elimination of pre-existing conditions. E exactly. And once they hear and understand that, they're excited about it and they don't want that to be taken away from them. It's interesting. The opponents of the ACA, uh, their mantra has been repeal and replace. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken with some members uh, of the opposition and I understand why they choose to oppose the ACA, the repeal part. What I have not heard from the opponents is the replace part, what they want to replace it with. Um, and I think it's becoming clear that we're not hearing that. Right. The plan has not come forward. I'm, right. I'm just, I'm neutral. Right. But that's right. what, are your constituents saying that? Are they seeing, are they perceiving that there's no replace being offered? They are, perceiving that, but more importantly, they're, to me, they're not expressing it. And when you look at the opposition, the Republicans that are saying that, the question I pose to them, replace it with what? And that is the big question. And if you look at what uh, Romney is thinking about doing, about repealing and replacing, again, if you look at his plan when he was governor of Massachusetts, it had an exchange and had a mandate. It's exact, very similar, very to, similar. The, to the yes. ACA. Very similar. At the same time, I want to uh, parse through the Supreme Court ruling. The first portion upheld the individual mandate mm -hmm. uh, up pursuant to Congress's taxing powers. The second portion uh, it was held unconstitutional, and the court said that the federal government cannot require the states to expand Medicaid. Medicare. Yes. Um, how do, will that play out in the states? Well, in California, it won't play out in the sense that we will take all the federal dollars. We're going to embrace that to make sure we can get our $14 billion of revenue that will come in to help insure those individuals. Where it's going to play out is in the states like uh, Florida or Texas who are saying they're not going to take federal dollars. What's going to happen at the federal level, the federal government's going to save money, but wh who it's going to hurt are the constituents in that state who won't get that, that care. I wonder, though, I mean, is it really chest pounding right now? And in the end, Republican governors who say they oppose the ACA will wind up taking right. that money because how do you say no to federal dollars? You know what's going to happen is their constituents, which are the patients, but more importantly for them, the providers, the doctors, and the hospitals, they're going to lobby their prospective legislature and say, look, you're leaving federal dollars on the table that we can use to treat these patients and get reimbursed with. That's where they're going to hear it from. As I understand, <coughs> one of the benefits, perceived benefits, spoken benefits of the ACA is the health benefit exchanges. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it allows uh, small businesses, individuals to work with an, ex an exchange, a health exchange, who then will negotiate rates and presumably with that negotiating power, right. their insurance rates will be lower than they would have been. Yes. I also understand that since we have set that up that we're going to be one of the earliest adopters of this. So how close are we? We are the first state to pass the law to get an exchange. We're way ahead of very many other states. We're actually putting out the bid and have signed contracts to do the IT, the okay. internet, the to do out the marketing and the advertising. We're going to be signing contracts middle of next year to get ready for 2014. It's just, it's around the corner. We are way ahead of the rest so of the country. So when should small businesses start looking towards working through the health benefit exchanges? They can do it. They can start signing up probably within the next uh, six to eight months. I want to bring it home for a second and speak about California's health care. And as I understand it, under the budget plan passed in June, uh, individuals or families that were on a plan called Healthy Families mm -hmm. are now being moved into, is it Medi-Cal? Medi-Cal, that is correct. Medi-Cal. Yes. 
How does that movement interplay with the federal government's health care reform, if at all? Well, Healthy Families was under what was called Mr. Mib. It was an entity set up to administer the program, get the um, network of doctors. A state program. A state program. It was, Mr. Mib is now going to be phased out and we're going to put it in the department. And what's going to happen? Department of? Of managed health care. Okay. Uh, department of health care. Okay. Uh, which is where it's, uh, houses the Medi-Cal portion I of it. I understand. Okay. Here's what's going to happen is I, I would say, say probably everything under 200% of poverty level is all going to be within that department and what we're going to do is we're going to rebrand Medi-Cal as it is. So rather than thinking of Medi-Cal as welfare, we're going to think of it as health care for those segment of the population. And rebranding, I don't know the name, let's say it's going to be called health care for right. Californians, CalHealth. We need to be able to draw down those federal dollars, rebrand it, make sure people have access to health care, and get them to see their doctors. Some of the frustration, though, behind this shift, though, is that, as I understand it, the reimbursement rates to doctors was higher in healthy families and now will be lower in Medi-Cal. Am I correct? Well, I mean, to score the savings, there will probably be a slight decrease in reimbursement rates, but also understand that the um, moving it from Mr. Mib to Medi-Cal won't happen unless there is guaranteed that there will be a provider networks that are adequate to see these patients. But once the 2014 comes along, we're going to have an infusion of federal dollars. I'll give you an example. Medi-Cal reimbursement for providers is going to be at 100% of Medicare, which is a, a substantial increase in reimbursement rate. So therefore, we're going to attract more providers to go into it, assuming we have the provider networks to do that, which will help those that segment of the population. I want to ask you about Proposition 30, mm -hmm. which is Governor Brown's tax initiative. Increased sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, increased tax on the wealthy for seven years. Uh, if it passes or doesn't pass, is health care impacted by Prop 30 in um, California? No, not as much. What will be impacted, unfortunately, will be education. Okay. As you know, this last budget cycle that we passed had triggers in that scored the uh, governor's uh, initi right. initiative to pass this coming November. If it doesn't pass and the voters say no, there will be triggers that will affect K through 12, unfortunately, again, CSU, UC, and community colleges. So as you're speaking to your constituents about health care, mm -hmm. and you say they seem to be warming to the ACA, what are they saying to you about Prop 30? Well, I mean, everywhere I go publicly, I uh, support the governor's initiative. I tell them the importance of passing it and understanding that at one time we had this assessment on the tax and it also is a continuation. To make sure that they understand that if it fails, that public schools will be affected. And most of the constituents in my district understand that and I, and I believe they're supportive of and it. And I think about your district, which is southeast LA County mm -hmm. essentially, in order for Prop 30 to pass, it needs to run up big margins in your yes. communities, yeah. really big margins. Do you see your voters coming out to vote for you know, president and then go all the way down the ballot to right. find Prop 30? I believe they will, and here's the reason why. The eastern part of the San Gabriel Valley, it's a working class, predominantly Latino. It has a lot of uh, Asian Pacific Islanders. It's a diversity mm -hmm. uh, of California, which reflects its diversity. And if you look at Measure R when it came out. Was that That was the transportation, transportation mm -hmm. one several years ago. The same argument was then, and the San Gabriel Valley voted in record numbers. I really believe that once they understand the issue, they will vote for the initiative and it will pass. As a doctor yourself of optometry, you know that California is not a smoking friendly state. Mm -hmm. And yet in June, we saw voters say no to a cigarette tax. Right. Does that cause you concern as you look at Prop 30? Um, a little bit of concern. <coughs> but here's, here's the big difference, is if you look at the backway industry, they put millions of dollars in the opposition. I don't see their being a large entity that put that kind of dollars in to oppose the, the governor's initiative. The chambers are supporting the governor's yes. initiative. Yeah. Right. His name is Ed Hernandez, member of the California State Senate. When we come back, we'll be speaking with Charles Calderon, the majority leader of the California State Assembly. I'm Brad Palmer, so we'll be right back on California Edition.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer. And so our guest, Charles Calderon, member of the California State Assembly. He's the majority leader of that body. Coming up, we'll be speaking with his son, who is running for the California State Assembly. But first, thank you for joining us, Mr. Calderon. I want to speak with you about a major issue in California, and that is pensions. Um, as you know, the governor uh, submitted a 12-point plan for pension reform. The Republicans actually submitted the governor's plan. Not much has happened with it as we speak today, but talk to me about your perceived need or lack of need for pension reform. The, clearly there's a, a need for pension ref, reform. Uh, right now, um, the state as an employer is, is putting in about 3%, a little better than 3% of the budget for the right. state of California. That will grow to 15%. Um, possibly in the next two to three years. That quickly? Uh, very, very quickly. Right now, we have a, um, a, um, about a hundred billion dollar uh, unfunded liability. It's interesting you mentioned that. I know the Little Hoover Commission has said that California's pensions are dangerously underfunded. Stanford has put out studies saying that California's pensions are, they don't have the money they need to pay out through the life of the pensioners and it can be a very dicey proposition. That being said, it seemed as if last year that the Republicans and the Democrats had gotten together and come up with a deal for pension reform, but it fell apart. And what the Republicans have said, it's because the unions got to the governor and wouldn't allow pension reform to move forward. Why will this year be different than last year then? Well, unions don't permit or allow but you know what the I'm governor saying. or the legislature to do anything. You know what I'm saying. Um, it, it's it's a fairness issue, um, and and you have to approach it back to the fact that we have a contract with state employees, right. so we have an obligation to follow through on our contract obligation, and uh, moreover, for years we paid them less because we gave them. Uh, a little better benefit package, including retirement. And, and it's interesting you talk about that we have a contract because what I think a lot of people may not realize is if we pass pension reform today, that really is on a go forward basis. We can't turn around and change those pension packages unless there's a negotiation. Yes. I do want to talk to you though about the union movement, a movement which I, you know, we, we, they've done a lot in for this country, so I don't want to cast aspersions on the union movement by any stretch of the imagination. That being said, if you look at the mood of the country today, in Wisconsin, for example, a governor who really came out strongly against the unions beat back a recall. In California, we have seen San Jose, a moderate city. San Diego, moderate to conservative city, voted for pension reform overwhelmingly. I mean, there is a mood out there for pension reform. Is Sacramento hearing that? Are the, are, are the unions, you know, and I don't mean that pejoratively, are the unions hearing that? Well, Wisconsin, uh, recalls are very hard to, of course. to win, and, and, and the governor is going to face a very stiff re-election effort in, in a couple of years. So I, I think that there was some impact there. Um, are, are unions listening? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, they have a they have a function to perform, and that function that they perform um, creates and preserves a middle class, because they they are the only thing standing between an employer and an employee in terms of work safety, but even more so in terms of quality but, of life he, and income. Here's the challenge. I mean, if I were a union official and I looked at the landscape, my biggest fear would be if we don't get a package pass through the legislature, we're going to get an initiative. And the initiative could be written by anyone, presumably an interest group that didn't have the union's interest at heart. So it just seems as if, I mean, the movement, whatever that means, should be rushing to get reform because the reform you get out of the governor is going to be a lot better than the reform you get from the voters. Well, that's certainly a political calculation, but statewide, you know, recent field polls show that 53% of the people in California thought benefits were just fine or I've not generous that. enough. I've seen that. So uh, there isn't that kind of, of uh, public awareness uh, that you might get in San Jose or you might get in a, on a smaller, mm -hmm. certainly in San Diego. Right. So, but nevertheless, um, it's important, but it's important for the state to maintain its contractual obligations. And, um, and it's also important to understand that, um, that labor unions 
uh, for instance, in Germany, it's the strongest economy in Europe, they have strong unions. I mean, there's a role for labor unions. Now, institutionally, they act like any other institution and make big mistakes. Right. They have their own political agendas. Uh, you know, they, they overreach. But, but as a movement, I, I think unions are important. So what's happening then right now? Because look, we, we see the same landscape. I mean, unions are really getting beaten up, especially public sector unions. And you know, since, as you say, they seem to do perform a very important role, why has the union movement lost its footing vis-a-vis -vis the electorate? Well, you know, the, this, the, the pension, unfunded liability, it's a serious problem. But it is a long-term problem, uh, and y I would liken it to when, when you buy a, mo a home and you have a mortgage. Right. Uh, if you had to put up that money up front, you couldn't do it. But monthly payments over a period of time, um, it's manageable. Now, the analogy using for, for pensions is that uh, you're on a variable rate. <laughs> well stated, yes. <laughs> You're on a variable well, rate. It depends how PERS does, STRS does. And the interest can go up, right? or the interest can stay the same, or the interest can go down. Right now the interest is going up, and that takes a bigger chunk out of the state general fund. But it's a, the, to some degree, it was a, it's an issue foisted upon us uh, by our you know, loyal opposition to the Republican Party. So, you know, one could argue they did quite well in submitting the governor's 12-point plan, you know, triangulation at its best. But that being said, look, you're a Democrat. You say you, that we need pension reform. Republicans say we need pension reform. The governor says we need pension reform. Are we going to see pension reform? I think we're going to see pension reform. The, the question is how much, how effective. I mean, the government's plan may be 6 to $10 billion over the next 10 years. Over the next 10 years, the unfunded liability could grow to $100 billion. Right. So you can't do it just cuts alone. Uh, and and my, my Republican colleagues will pound away on Democrats about the unfunded liability, but because they just want us to cut. They want us to cut somewhere else in order to meet the unfunded liability, which means there's no more other programs, which means that's good for but them. Because here's, what, here's what's interesting, though. Do you need to negotiate more with the Republicans or the governor? I mean, who's you can't negotiate with the Republicans. First of all, they they want too much, and then they keep moving the goalposts. They keep moving the goalposts. You have to understand, Republican philosophy generally, as a party, believes there should be small government. Right. They don't act that way in a lot of instances. For instance, whether it's uh, you know women's uh, uh, right to choose or women's health issues, they want to be right there you know, intimately, but they believe in less government. And so you can't negotiate, and you've seen that with the president and the, the current but, Congress. But if there is to be pension reform in Sacramento, do you need 50% plus one, or do you need two thirds? Because if you need 50% plus one, you don't need to negotiate with the Republicans. You need 50% plus one if all you're gonna do is cut. If all you're gonna do is cut benefits, increase contributions, and change the PERS board, no, you don't need, they don't need Republicans. But the problem is you can't solve the problem by just cutting and increasing pension benefits. You need, there needs to be a revenue side of it, and there is no revenue side. So what's side. the revenue side of the pension reform plan? Well, the revenue side is more revenue for the state, so the state can contribute, a, make a bigger contribution. But is that Prop 30, or is that part of this reform plan? No, 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 that, that's part of the overall solution. Uh -huh. oh, uh, we cannot solve the pension problem Un just by cuts alone, unless we eliminate it, right? And that's not that's not going to happen. Um, and so w we need a we need a revenue component, but we don't we can't get a revenue component. So we're just going to you know continue. To, we won't kick the can. We'll just nudge it along. In our final moments, will we see a pension reform package passed and signed by the governor this year? Yes. Okay. His name is Chuck Calderon. He is the majority leader of the California State Assembly. When we come back, we'll be speaking with his son, Ian Calderon, who is a candidate for the California State Assembly in the 57th Assembly District. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We'll be right back on Charter California Edition.
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. You've met the father, now you will meet the son. His name is Ian Calderon. He is a candidate for the California State Assembly, the 57th Assembly District, which includes portions of South, Southeast LA County. Is that fair? Right, right. City, La Puente, Norwalk, Santa Fe Springs, Whittier, and a couple unincorporated areas in Hacienda Heights. L let's talk about your candidacy. It's an exciting one. You're a young man. Uh, you come from a family with some outstanding public servants. What made you decide? to pursue political office. You know, I've grown up in this. I mean, right. it is it is my life. I was born in 1985. My, my father first ran and got elected in 1982. Right. And so, you know, I, I feel that from my generation, I really have a different, unique perspective on public service. I mean, it is, it's in our family's blood. And I mean, think about it. Your father is currently a member of the California State Assembly. Mm -hmm. Your uncle Tom was an assembly member. Yes. Your uncle Ron is a California state senator. Yes. And so the Calderon name is well known. How is that for you? I have to ask. I mean, these are the brothers. You're the next generation. No, I mean, it, it's great. I mean, they've done a lot for this community. And, uh, you know, you, there, you find a lot of people that do remember what it is that they do. But at the same time, you know, as much as it is a blessing, you know, sometimes it can be, a, you know. Has it been hard? It ha I won't say it's been hard. <laughs> it's just, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for this position and, you know, for what they've done for the community. And I'm, and I'm honored to be a part of this family. So you want to run, you want to represent your generation. What do you hope to do should you join, uh, I guess it would be your uncle in Sacramento. Your father's termed out. Your uncle will still be there in the Senate. You know, I hope to bring, you know, a different perspective really coming from a generation that has suffered from a lot of the decisions and, and choices that we've made over the last couple of years. You know, I, I spoke a lot in my campaign about my grandmother, Rita, and all her generation did, you know, the, the generation that we refer to as the greatest generation mm -hmm. in terms of infrastructure and, and education and that their goal was building for the future. And I feel that we've kind of skewed from that. Well, let me ask you, you had a competitive primary. Yeah. And so you walked, you marched, you fought hard. And so I want to get a sense from you, what are your voters telling you? You know, what are the readers telling you? What are, what is your generation telling you? They want to know that things are going to get better. They want to know that there's going to be a job for them. They want to know that while they encourage their kids to go and get a, a college education, they can get in they can afford it. They can pay off that debt once they get out of there because there's a job waiting there for them. They want to know, how are you going to invest in us and invest in our future? Well, let's talk about that investment because I think it's fair to say that when your father was first in the legislature, it was a very different time. Yes. Um, in the 80s, it seemed as if one could argue that Democrats and Republicans got along. It, there was just more collegiality, more compromise. Currently, we don't see a lot of that. Um, the Republicans say they're being shut out. The Democrats say the Republicans are recalcitrant. What, what do you plan to do to try to, if you do try to, break through that clutter? Because even though you would be part of the majority party, you know, it would be nice if the party started talking again. Well, you know, for me, I'm less concerned what your party identification is. I'm a Democrat and I know why I'm a Democrat. But it's irrelevant to me w what party you stand on. I want to know who you are as a person and that we have a common goal. Our common goal is to make sure that five to ten years from now we're in a better position and that we're making sure we have jobs for our kids and that we're educating the next generation to compete in a world in, uh, in a world economy. You know, we've kind of lost this label of made in America. But what we cannot lose is innovated in America. And I know whether you're a Democrat or Republican, this is something that's going to be important to you. So let's talk about innovating, because if you look at California, its crown jewel of innovation had been, maybe still is, the UC system and the CSU system. But if you look at the last five years, let's say, budgets to higher education in California have been eviscerated. I'm not commenting on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. um, the UC system has lost over a billion dollars, CSU has lost over a billion dollars. What do you make of that? You know, over the last 10 years, we've seen a, a decrease by about 9% in general fund dollars going into our higher education and an increase of about 26% going into uh, uh, our, our corrections. Mm -hmm. And what we need to make sure that we're doing is that, you know, we're pr putting our priorities in place and we're, we're investing in our future, and that is in our higher education. You know, 
And when you take a look, you want to look at what your return on investment is going to be. So for every dollar that we put in to our college and universities, we received a 450% return on those that actually go to college and, and graduate. as it stands now, we are putting less dollars in. We are it putting less fact. dollars in. That being said, there is an initiative on the ballot in November, mm -hmm. and I want to get a sense from you, your thoughts on it. It's called Proposition 30 now. It's the governor's initiative. And what it does is it increase sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, increases tax on the wealthy for seven years. Um, a significant portion of that money would go to the CSU and UC system. What's your sense of that proposition? We need to pass it. Mm. I mean, it, it is a proposition that people, people need to decide what kind of California they want. If we don't pass it, we're not going to have the revenues we need to pay for the programs and the education that we, system that we, that we want. Well, let's talk about whether we can pass it. Because if you look at the history of California over the last decade, let's say, the last time we saw a statewide tax increase passed by the voters was 2004. Mm -hmm. In 2009, the voters said absolutely not. 65% voted no. Now it was a different governor, a different time. But Ian, I mean, in June, we had an initiative on the ballot to increase taxes on cigarettes. Mm -hmm. We're not in Kentucky, we're not in North Carolina, we're not in Virginia. Californians don't like smoking, and yet it failed. It right. failed. And so, you think Californians are ready? Well, you know, I think it, you know, a part of it is going to be getting the information to the voters and helping them, them understand that they are making a choice, that when you vote for the initiative, this is what you're going to be funding. If we don't pass this initiative, this is what we're going to lose, and this is what's going to get cut. You know, we have to let the voters understand that they have a choice, and they need to choose. And the right choice, in my opinion, in this situation, is to pass that initiative. They also have a choice with regards to another initiative that deals with taxes. Mm -hmm. And that's the initiative that's being proposed by Molly Munger. And she's fighting hard. There is no doubt about that. She has gone to court to try to get advantage with her initiative. Her initiative is very different. What it does is it taxes essentially everyone, mm -hmm. um, from the poorest to the wealthiest. It's a sliding scale upward. Some could argue that's a little more equitable. What do you make of her initiative? Um, you know, I think her heart's in the right place, and you have to commend, commend anybody who wants to take that step and then devote their lives to, towards doing something mm -hmm. like that. But you want to talk about an initiative that's going to pass or fail, you know, nobody right now really wants to vote to increase their own taxes. And so if we have multiple ballot, uh, initiatives on the ballot, it's, it, it, there's a greater likelihood that they both fail. But they are on the ballot. But I mean, they are gonna there be were going to be three. Right. There's now two. So, you know, it, it's who gets their messaging out and, and who makes the better argument. So as you campaign for your seat, will you be talking about Proposition 30? Is it so important to you and the future of California that you will make it part of your platform, your campaign? Oh, well, a major part of my, my platform is the future and investing in higher education. And so it's something that I will absolutely uh, talk about and encourage uh, my constituency to, to support. Now, if I look at the communities that you will likely represent, uh, some well-heeled communities, some challenged communities, mm -hmm. as you march through the district, what are they saying to you? Well, they're saying a lot of things. They, you know, they, they're saying, uh, I'm out of work. I need, a, I need a job. They're saying, my kids need to get a good education. What are you doing when you're only cutting? But are they saying they want to increase their taxes? You know, I, I, I think that you know, the fact of the matter is, is we went through a very bad recession. We lost a lot. And we're not going to just magically get out of this position. We all have to work together, and we all have to support something that gives us the revenues that we need. Now, I think that it needs to be coupled with creating jobs and what we mm -hmm. can do to create jobs to bring in the revenues from, in, uh, from, um, uh, from taxes. But we also need to understand that. More importantly, and finally, how are you enjoying yourself? I mean, yes, you come from a political family, but this is you. I mean, you're the one knocking on the door for yourself. You know, I, I, I'm not going to say that I'm not already used to it right. because I've done it so much sure, for, for so long. No, but I, I love it. I love it because I love meeting people. Right. I love talking to people. I love hearing people's different perspectives and hearing right. their ideas and what's important to them because I can't go up and make a good decision unless I know what it is that my constituent right. wants, okay. constituency wants. I hear you. His name is Ian Calderon. He, is a, he hopes to be a member of the California State Assembly. That election will be held in November. He is one of two candidates running for the 57th Assembly District. My name is Brad Palmer. Thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition. Brad.